made aware just a couple of weeks ago that I actually have a catchphrase. Did you guys know that? I always stand up here and I say, I trust your Bibles are open to. But let me try it differently. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. We're going to move through verses 6 to 15. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your manifest presence here. As you promised that when two or three are gathered in your name, as your word says that you inhabit, you live in the praises of your people. But I ask that in your presence, our hearts would be made truly glad and grateful and thank you and thankful as we consider so great a salvation we have in Christ. So now confirm and strengthen us in goodness, convict us of sin, and cause us to love and trust Jesus more as we turn our hearts and our minds to your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Acts chapter 16, we're picking up at verse 6. And by the time we get to verse 6, we have Paul and Silas. And who was the one that they picked up along the way? Do you remember from last week? Timothy, that's right. They are making their way through Phrygia <laughs> and Galatia. This is now Paul's second missionary journey. You know, it's worth just pausing to remember that this is the same Paul, the same Saul of Tarsus, who was commissioned by the resurrected, risen Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. So profound was that encounter with the risen Jesus that he devoted every bit of the remainder of his life to the propagation and the sharing of the gospel to the ends of the known world. That's Paul. And today's passage marks a significant turning point in the spread of that gospel around the world. I find it curious, too, how it happens. It happens in an unexpected way. Look at verse 6 and 7. It says, And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, they being those guys that we just said, the mission team. And it says that they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Verse 7. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus didn't allow them. The Holy Spirit forbade them. The Spirit of Jesus would not allow them. It seems like an odd thing, doesn't it? And when you read that in this account, you wonder, well, how, right? How was it that the Holy Spirit forbade them? How was it that the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to take the gospel to Asia? Why? Well, in the providence of God and in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Scripture does not directly answer those questions. And I believe that that's actually one of the strengths of this passage. Because although it's specific in terms of the Spirit not allowing them and redirecting them, this account is vague enough that it can apply to each and every one of us in different situations. Do you know what I mean by that? We all have key moments in our life. Sometimes those key moments feel significant and they carry the weight of heaviness and you know that they're a big deal. You have to make a decision and you see that it's going to lead to one or the other outcome and you feel the weight of that decision. Other times they're seemingly small decisions that actually through the butterfly effect have rippling consequences that go down. But the fact of the matter is that our existential experience as humans is lived out in a way that we are all faced with having to make decisions. Where do we go? What do we do? What school do we go to? What career path do we take? You know, decisions that bear consequence. Well, perhaps you're even facing one of those decisions today. And maybe you are looking at that and you're saying, the consequence of my decisions has not turned out exactly the way that I had hoped or prayed. And so you're frustrated. Well, the first thing that I want you to do is to consider a decision tree. How do you make decisions about where the Lord is leading you and where he wants you to go? The first thing to do is to 
Steep yourself in God's word. So you can ensure that the thing that you're choosing to do is actually consistent with God's will, his character as revealed in scripture. The second thing to do is to pray about it. To pray and seek the Lord's blessing on whatever endeavor you're undertaking. The third thing would be to consult with other Christians, perhaps those who are more mature in the faith than you are. You know, you're trying to map a pathway. You're saying, where does the Lord want me to go? What does he want me to do? Well, those are three pretty good foundational principles. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 6 says, when you trust in the Lord with all your heart, don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. So if you're faced with decisions, that's a pretty good decision tree, right? But then you come to a passage like this one. There could be no more noble cause than what Paul and his missions team have set out to do. They want to take the gospel to Asia. And yet the spirit of Jesus does not allow them. Here's the point. God will sometimes lead his people by opening doors. God also leads his people by closing doors. You've probably experienced this in your life. You know, through diligence and conscientiousness, you pursue goals. You don't know exactly where those are going, but all of a sudden before you is set this open door opportunity, and so you step into it. And you can see God's hand of blessing upon that, him leading you through an open door. But have you ever experienced times where your pursuit seems to be noble and good? You have the best of intent, and yet God closes the door? Well, there's two things that we as Christian men and women need to do in order to navigate open doors and closed doors that are from our Lord God directing us. The first thing that we need is to be possessed of wisdom. Wisdom that comes from having our minds renewed by the Holy Spirit through diligent study of the Word of God and intentional fellowship with other Christians. That's how wisdom comes about. Wisdom doesn't just fall upon you. It's not random chance. You don't trip and fall into wisdom. It takes discipline. We need the sort of wisdom that brings prayer and discernment to bear on the present moment. You know, you got to figure out, is this a moment that demands resilience and stick to Or is this me banging my head against a door that God has closed? That takes wisdom. The second thing that we need is the grace to accept it. If God has closed a door, it can sometimes expose your over-invested ego. Look, if you are trucking through life and you are telling everyone, including your own soul, that what you're actually doing is just trying to seek and serve the Lord, but then the Holy Spirit will forbid you from proceeding, the Spirit of Jesus will not allow you to proceed in that path, the door is closed, that will expose whether you had an overinvestment of ego and self in that or if you were in fact just serving the Lord. Let me say that a different way. When the Lord God closes a door and leads you by closing a door, if your ambition is personal, if you have personal ambition invested in it, you want people to think that you're smart, you want people to think that you're powerful, you're doing it for your own ends, then you will be met with nothing but frustration. However, if your ambition is for the gospel and for the Lord, then when the Lord God closes a door, you will graciously receive it because your only ambition is to work at the master's behest. And the master has closed it. 
So this is what happens in our passage. Paul has never been a shrinking violet, right? I don't know exactly what this closed door in Asia looked like. I don't know how the Lord did it. But it couldn't have just been the potential of persecution because Paul endured persecution gladly for the gospel. Somehow he knew that this was the Holy Spirit closing the door. And so he says, okay. Look at verses 9 to 10. As God has closed this door in Asia, Paul accepts it. And God then opens a door in Macedonia. Look, friend, perhaps this is for you today. If you've been banging your head against the wall, it could very well be that perseverance is what's required. That you, by the power of the Spirit that, that, that strengthens you, need to endure under a hard task. But this passage this morning invites a different perspective, a different possibility. Have you ever considered that the thing that you're banging your head against is actually a door that the Spirit of Jesus has closed? He's closed it because he has another plan. And so the hardship that you're facing is actually precisely the goodness of God. It's because God in his mercy loves you so much that he is preventing you from going in a particular direction, even one that seems good and godly to you, because he wants you to go into another place. Take a moment, if that's you, just to simply pray and ask God. He will either confirm you in your present path and grant you the strength to endure, or he will open another door for you. Okay, that's verses 6, 7, 8. Verses 8 uh, through 10, this is the Macedonian call. Look at verse 9. And then a vision appeared to Paul in the night. It was a man from Macedonia who was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Verse 10, and when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So the door closes in Asia. Paul accepts it as a closed door from God. And then a man appears to Paul in a vision or in a dream. I don't know how, but this man was recognizable to Paul as a Macedonian man. I can't really tell the difference between Macedonians and Greeks, and if that offends you, I'm sorry. But somehow Paul knew that, right? It was a man from Macedonia. What I want you to notice in this verse, though, is um, it's most likely in Troas that Paul and his missions team pick up another partner, another member. Did you notice that? Look at verse 9. It says, Immediately we sought to go into Macedonia. Look back at verse 6. It says, And they went through the region, right? There's a shift here in this passage where the author, Luke, shifts from describing the missionary party as they to we. What does that mean? Well, it most likely means that as Paul's team are prevented from going into Asia with the gospel and now they're about to launch into Macedonia and they come through Troas, they pick up Luke, the physician, and so everything from this point forward in the account is no longer just stuff that Luke has accumulated through other eyewitness accounts. Now he is writing the story as he experienced it and saw it with the missions team. It's this subtle change in pronouns that announces that Luke the physician, Luke the one who 
under the inspiration of the Spirit, penned Acts and the gospel with his name on it, is now part of this missionary journey. And there's something that's um, both convicting and encouraging for me in that. You got to imagine that Luke, this physician, has his practice going in Troas. He presumably has a comfortable life. But the missions team comes through, he hears the gospel, and he heeds the call. He then goes on to write the gospel of Luke and the accounts that we still read this day. He said, so we immediately sought to go into Macedonia. So the Macedonian man, let's go back to that. The Macedonian man comes to Paul in his sleep, in a vision or in a dream, and he makes an appeal to Paul. He says, come and help us. The semantic range for the word here that's used for help would include ideas like save. Come, we need help. We need saving. Come to Macedonia. And so Paul, we're told in verse 10, concludes that this is all part of God's plan. God's closed the door in Asia so that he can open the door to Macedonia. It says that he concluded that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. You know, it's no small thing for someone to ask for help, be it in a dream, in a vision, or in person. It takes a lot of humility for someone like this Macedonian man in the vision to say, would you please come help us? In your life, you've probably had many people who've come to you seeking help. It sometimes can be a little bit annoying, right? Because it happens at the worst possible moment when you're busy. Or maybe it's the shape that that request takes. Seldom do people who are in help ever come to you with a clear, concise request. They'll usually come to you and dump on you this massive laundry list of like, sprawling things that are like impossible for you to try to solve. Well, it's incumbent upon you as a Christian man or woman to hear their cry for help and to realize that the help that they actually need is in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Macedonian man appears to Paul in a vision, in a dream. He's asking for help. And Paul isn't like, gosh, I wonder what kind of help he needs. He's like, man, you need the gospel. You need Jesus. He wakes up the next morning. He gathers the boys together. He says, guys, we're going to Macedonia to preach the gospel. They need Jesus. Oh, for a healthy dose of that in our lives and in our church. Anytime we see people in need, to understand that their deepest need is for the Lord Jesus Christ. They need to be saved. So they heed this call, this Macedonian call. And in so doing, the gospel moves for the first time to the continent of Europe. Think about that. Now back then they would not have had the continental um, boundaries that we have today, right? All of these places would have been different provinces in the Roman Empire. And so it's true that Paul and his missions team, they were crossing this major threshold with the gospel unawares. It was all part of the sovereign providence and plan of God that the gospel would move from um, the Middle East, the Near East, through past Asia, and now into modern-day European continent. But Paul and the missions team wouldn't have been aware of the profound nature of that transition. We certainly see it today. Verses 11 to 12. So they set sail from Troas. We made a direct voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis. And from there to Philippi, which was a leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. 
The missions party has now sailed from Troas, Samothrace, Neapolis, and then to Philippi. Um, we know from this account and also from history from that time that Philippi was a metropolis and a hub in the province of Macedonia in Europe. Philippi was named after Alexander the Great's father, Philip of Macedon. And so when you hear that they've arrived in Philippi, you've got to understand they're like arriving in the New York City or the London or the major metropolis of Europe. And this is the moment where the gospel goes from being a Middle Eastern sect to a global force. From Europe, the gospel will spread through Asia and through Africa. It will eventually make its way to North America and to South America and to Australia. This is the beginning of the knowledge of the Lord covering the earth as the waters cover the sea. So, so hands up this morning if you are of European descent. Hands up. Right? Keep your hands up. Hands up if you are of African descent. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Put your hands up also if, you're from Af if your ancestors are from Africa. Everyone keep your hands up if you're a European. Hands up if you're ancestors are from Asia. Hands up. Keep your hands up. Hands up if your ancestors are from Australia. Hands up if your ancestors are from South America. Well, see, the point is, this is the moment that is your gospel legacy. Because Paul and the missions team heeded the gospel call of the Macedonians to come and help them. Oh, don't miss the powerful providence and sovereignty of God. His purposes cannot be thwarted. They echo through the millennia, resulting in the saving of people like you and me. Praise God. That's the Macedonian call. All right, verses 13 to 15. This is the conversion of Lydia. So they're in Philippi, right? In verse 12, we're told that. Verse 13, on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we were supposed, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira. So this mission team now, they've made their way. They've, heated the, they've been prevented in Asia. They've made their way to um, through Macedonia, they're now in Philippi. They are following their already well-established pattern for mission strategy. When Paul goes into a region, the first thing he does is identify a major city. He goes to that major city. Once he's in the major city, he goes looking for a synagogue where he can preach on the Sabbath. That's his pattern. But in Philippi, he discovers that there is no synagogue. Presumably, there was not the critical number of Jews required by the law to establish a synagogue. And so Paul and the boys make their way to the riverside. Why did they go to the riverside? Because it was common practice back then that if you were a Jew and you lived in a city that did not have a critical mass of Jews to warrant having a synagogue, on the Sabbath, you would go to the riverside to pray and to worship. You did so because the river would provide the means by which you could practice ritual purification. So Paul and the missions team, they're like, okay, we're in Philippi. There's no synagogue here. We're going to go find god fears. We're going to go to the riverside. And that's just what they did. When they get to the riverside, they find a group of women praying. And one in particular whose name was Lydia. You know, I often joke when there's awkward names in Scripture that you should consider them for your children. But if you're having a baby girl, consider Lydia. What a hero. Scripture tells us a couple of things about Lydia. Okay, 
Look at verse 14. The first thing that we're told is that she is a seller of purple goods. Now, can you imagine what that was? Lydia worked in textiles. She dyed fabric purple. Now, from that already, we know that this um, purple dye was very, very expensive. Purple dye back at that time was only gained through crushing particular seashells. And so it was reserved for the extravagantly wealthy. We're told also that it's purple dye, which would indicate to us that Lydia's business was not only textiles and dyeing, it was then selling to different varying degrees of royalty. So what do we know about Lydia? Well, we know that she was a mover and a shaker. She was enterprising and capable. If she was alive today, you'd say that she made bank, right? She was capable. She had this entire business that she was operating on her own of purple clothing. And here we're told that she heard by the riverside. We're told that the Lord God opened her heart so that she would pay attention to what Paul said. She believed. And so Lydia is the very first European convert to Christ. You know, let let that one sink in for a moment. In one sense, if you are a Christian and you are of European descent, you trace your spiritual lineage back to Lydia. Isn't that remarkable? But I want us to press even further into this first thing that we know about her, right? She dealt in purple goods. Lydia is a wealthy woman. She's a convert to Christ in Philippi. We find out in Scripture that as this unfolds, well, just look at the next couple of verses. Verse 15, she invites Paul and the missions team into her home. And so already at this early stage of the church, you see the connection between an open heart to the gospel, and an open home to Christian ministry. Lydia is wealthy. She's established. She's living in Philippi. We're told later in Scripture that it is in her home that the church in Philippi is established and strengthened. Later on, when Paul will write his letter to the Philippians, okay, He writes this letter back to the church that's in Philippi that's being supported by Lydia's household. And Paul will tell those Philippian Christians, he'll say, I thank God for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Well, in Greek, the word that Paul uses for partnership is an economic term. It's the exact same word that two parties would put into a business contract if they were entering into an enterprise that was financial, partnership. And so when Paul writes his letter back to the Philippian church several years from this point, he will be writing back to Lydia's home and saying, I thank you for supporting this missions work financially. Look, Lydia was a main benefactor of the propagation of the gospel through Paul to the ends of the known world. She was wealthy. That's Lydia. God used her with all of her enterprising skills so that she could be a launching pad so that the gospel could go to the far ends of the world. She sold purple goods. 
Look, I want to I wanna press into this one even a little bit further, okay? Because I think it really matters for us today. It is God's good order. It is God's best. It is God's ideal that men, husbands, fathers, would lead in the home and in the church in godliness. However, we know from Scripture and from experience that it's often the case that women find themselves in situations other than that ideal. Lydia ruled over her own household. We're told that she was this seller in purple goods, and so we see how her life unfolds. We see that she was probably either single or widowed. But either way, not having a godly husband did not sideline her from usefulness to God. She instead ably shouldered that responsibility. Now look, this may be personal for some of the women who are gathered here this morning. Perhaps you are a Christian woman and for some reason you are without a man, without a husband to lead in godliness in your home. Maybe you're single. Maybe you're widowed. Maybe you have an unbelieving husband. God is calling you to shoulder that responsibility for this season. Lydia was a seller of purple goods. She was a husbandless leader in Philippi. She was saved, she was born again, and she was used mightily by God to establish the gospel on the European continent. This church that was established in her home was used to fund the propagation of the gospel across the known world. And so, Christian woman, if you find yourself single, widowed, or with an unbelieving husband, God has a plan for you. Look, if you have a husband who is leading in godliness, then it is your God-given role and responsibility as a wife, to come under and submit to his godly leadership. It is your task and your goal to encourage and strengthen his headship in your home so that your entire family may be blessed. The fact of the matter is, husbands can only lead in so far as wives will follow. You know, if you're, if you're a husband and you're like, I'm just going to be the leader, right? Right? Well, you can be the leader of nothing anytime you want. Wives, your calling, if you have a godly husband who's leading in godliness, is to encourage and strengthen and support that God-given ideal for you, for your home, for your family, by submitting to and following his godly leadership. And so your marriage and your home will be blessed. But if you find yourself without that ideal, rather than lament the absence of a husband or one who's capable of leading in godliness, look to Lydia and faithfully steward what the Lord God has entrusted to you. That's the first thing. She sold purple goods. The second thing we're told that she is a worshiper of God. You see that in verse 14? What does that mean? Well, it means that she um, had a heart that was oriented toward the Lord God, even though she had most likely never heard of Jesus of Nazareth or the gospel up to this point. Let me say that a different way. Lydia was one of whom Jesus spoke when he said, I have many sheep who are not yet of this fold. 
And you know, friends, that ought to shape the way that we as Christian men and women view the world. When you look out over the world, when you're interacting with strangers or people that you don't know well, can you look at them and say, are they potentially someone upon whom the Father has placed his affection from before time? They are a God worshiper. They just don't yet know the gospel. And so it's incumbent upon me to share the gospel with them so that the Holy Spirit can convict them of their sin and cause them to be born again by loving and trusting Jesus. I pray regularly that our staff, church leaders, and all of our church would day by day be given opportunities to share the Lord Jesus Christ with someone. I pray that each and every one of you would have the courage to seize those moments when they come up and have the wisdom to steward those moments well. You're going to encounter people like Lydia who have never heard the gospel, have never heard of the Lord Jesus Christ by name, but their heart is already predisposed to responding to the gospel. Friends, that's the only hope you have in evangelism. Look for it. Seize it. Tell people about Jesus. And the Lydia's will be converted. Sometimes you're going to find those people in the least likely places. All right, I want to I conclude with this. I want to look just more closely at verse 14. At Lydia's conversion. And I want us to see two things. The first, it says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Okay, the Lord opened her heart. That's the first thing. It is the consistent message of the New Testament that conversion takes place not when we open our hearts to God, but when God radically intervenes in our lives and changes the disposition of our hearts. That's what happened to Lydia. The Lord God opened her heart. It was God's work that wooed her and draw, drew her to Jesus. And you know, you might be thinking, gosh, Artie, that's like a theologically nuanced technical point. Who really cares? But friend, it really matters. Let me tell you why it matters. Because if you're sitting here this morning and you have the slightest inkling towards Jesus, in today's parlance, maybe you call yourself a seeker. If you think that that is your own doing because you are a curious person who wants to investigate things, then that will never lead you to assurance. The witness in the New Testament from the conversion of Lydia is that if you feel any ounce of drawing towards God in the Lord Jesus Christ, that is evidence that the Holy Spirit is at work in you, and he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. The Lord opened Lydia's heart. And if you are feeling that drawing and that wooing in your heart today, that's not because of anything that you're figuring out. That's because the Lord God is pursuing you. And he will save you. I was talking to a young man a little while ago, and, you know, he'd been seeking for some time. And I asked him, I said, have you ever been born again? And his answer to me was, well, I feel a lot closer to Jesus. I feel like I'm getting closer. And my question to him was, well, how will you know when you are close enough? And the Holy Spirit moved in this young man's heart, and he looked at me, and he said, I am right now. You see, because whether he realized it or not, 
his heart was captured by this truth that he was not pursuing God. The Lord was pursuing him and opening his heart to understand and pay attention. Friends, that's a salvation that's full of assurance. God's work, not Lydia's. God's work, not yours. That's the first thing. The Lord opened her heart. The second and last thing, he opened her heart to what was said by Paul. So you got to ask the necessary question. What was said by Paul? Well, sometimes in Acts, we have these evangelistic interactions recorded in detail. We have lengthy sermons, and we know exactly what they said. In this case, we don't know exactly what Paul said. But we can infer from the context of the entirety of Scripture that what he said to her was the gospel, the good news of God's love for her in Jesus. Let me say that differently. The message that saved Lydia 2,000 years ago is the same message that saves you today. That your crude experience through life has left you with an existential emptiness and need. But that's not just because you aren't trying hard enough. Maybe you're a seller of purple goods and you're very successful by many different measures, but you still have an emptiness and a hollowness within you. It's because you know that you're falling short of God's best. Even more so, you are, through your own will and through your own ego, you are living in open rebellion against the good God and King of this universe. And if those words fall upon you and you say, you know, R.D., it's true. I feel that. I know that I'm sinning. I know that I'm not doing what God would want me to do. Friend, that's good news because that's the Holy Spirit convicting you. And he only convicts those whom he's saving. The gospel message is that you, like Lydia, are a sinner whether you accept it or not. But that God in Jesus Christ has acted to save you. To pay the penalty that you owe so that you can be reconciled to God for all of eternity. Paul will later write in Romans that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Friends, that's the gospel message that saved Lydia, and it's the same one that saves you today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for your word. I pray now especially for those who are here this morning who have never responded to the gospel. God, I ask that each of those individuals, I, I, I pray, God, that they would not dismiss that as just emotionalism or sentimentality or, you know, just something was stirring. That they would feel and know that that's your Holy Spirit at work convicting them of their sin and causing them to trust in Jesus. God, would you open their hearts wide like Lydia and cause them to pay attention to the gospel, to be saved, to be born again. Father, we pray all of this to the greater glory of Jesus' name. Amen.